Okay. To say, okay, I can have those guys. They can actually come. What was what was a part of the book or a moment in the book or a scene that was not in your outline and just started almost happening out of your control and you sort of, oh, this is great. This is a character getting away from my plans for him or her and they're doing something even cooler than I thought. And you're describing the entire book. Oh! <laughs> you, you, you were assuming this is a book that was properly Can I rephrase my question? Outlined. What was the part when you stuck to the outline? What was that part? Uh, the, well, the, the outline wasn't really an outline. The outline was the least outline outline I've ever written. It was, um, it was a one-page document written in um, Reykjavik. I was, I was, I'd been very sleepless. I'd made a huge, foolish, technical mistake in flying from Minneapolis to Reykjavik, and uh, you were trying to kill Bjork. I like Bjork. She's not. Nice. She's funny. She, she, um, but she's hiding a pot of gold. <laughs> just... I, I'm always convinced that Bjork is secretly full. And I've, I've met her several times. I really like her. She talks. You sort of imagine you're talking to a four-year-old who's really, really smart because it's like, I know an awful lot of things, <laughs> and, and I've got socks. <laughs> The only time I've ever done my Bjork conversation ever. But I made the mistake it, to, to do this incredibly fast, because I've told this at every stop, and, and I'm feeling like I'm repeating myself on this, and I keep repeating myself. So, um, the plane from Minneapolis to Reykjavik hops over the pole very fast. So the plane takes off at 7.30 at night and gets in at midnight, Minneapolis time, which is 6 o'clock in the morning, regular time. Um, and it was July the 3rd, and I didn't sleep on the plane. And I landed, and by the time I was out of the airport, it was about 7.30 in the morning. And I thought, I'll just keep going till it gets dark. <laughs> The worst thing about hearing people laugh is going, you are all smarter than I was. <laughs> so I, I just kept going that day, and, and I had this lovely hotel room with incredibly thin white curtains that didn't close all the way. And at three o'clock in the morning, it was as if the sun had gone behind a cloud for about 40 minutes, and it came out again, and it was blinding daylight. And my body was just going, I don't know what's going on, but I'm with you, guy. <laughs> so, one o'clock in the afternoon the next day, I'm wandering around Reykjavik, the world has gone flat in the world. And that way that it, it sort of does when you just haven't slept. And I'm, I remember standing outside a restaurant a sushi restaurant, and it was closed. Nothing but better than I said sushi, dude. And I, I read the menu, and, and it listed, the last thing on the menu was pony sushi. <laughs> and I remember thinking, maybe I'm hallucinating. I'm looking at it again, and go, no, it definitely says pony sushi. And, and I, I wander off into this tourist diorama, and they have a, a flat-top diorama of the travels of Leif Erikson. And, going to, from, from Iceland to America. And I remember just looking at it and thinking, I wonder if they brought their gods with them. <laughs> and then suddenly I went, oh. <laughs> and I went back up to my room, my hotel, and I sat and wrote this one page letter saying, this is the story, and it's these two men, and this is what happens, and a storm is coming, and this is all the kind of stuff that's gonna be in it. And then I thought, I, I should call it something. So I thought, well, I'll put a placeholder title at the top. And so I wrote American Gods and sent it off to my agent and my editor. And um, a week later, I got home. And in the post waiting for me was the cover 
of the first edition of American Gods. <laughs> with American Gods and the lightning bolt and the, and the road and then Neil Gaiman. And it looked like a book cover. And it looked like the book cover of the book I was going to write. So I couldn't change the name. <laughs> it was what it was. Um, but that was my outline. My outline was a page description of the kind of stuff that was going to be in the book. Shannon was going to get up. Basically, it described chapter one. And then it mentioned that a storm was coming and, and some of the things that we were going to meet on the way. And it, it, writing it was absolutely weird and organic, and, which meant that I'd get stuck sometimes. And when I got stuck, I'd go away and I'd write one of the Coming to America sequences. And normally, well, by the time I'd finished that, I'd, I'd unstuck. You gotta stay up late more, man. You gotta, you gotta get that sleep. <laughs> we, should, we should probably do, do, do you have those cards? I have the questions in my, I've got questions in me pocket. These are some of the things that came from you lot. Yeah, you he doesn't just carry around questions. questions in his pocket. Anyway. Um, these are my handed in questions yeah. from, from the audience. Because we do not have an audience mic, so. Oh. These are from you. Oh, with a really cool last name. This is from a Larry Pontius. You've explored many different mediums of writing. What would you like to explore next? <laughs> um, well, the one that I'm excited about is I'm, I'm just starting to begin working with Stephen Merritt of, of the Magnetic Fields and the Gothic Archies and the Future Bible Heroes and Stephen Merritt. And um, Stephen and I are, are putting our heads together on building a musical based around the, um, the Grand Guignol Theatre of Horror of, of Paris in the 1920s. So I, I've never written a musical, and I've never written a weird interactive piece of theatre, and, and, and I wanted to do something that would have that kind of... And, and I wanted something that would be disturbing. So. <laughs> disturbing the actual good songs. No, no people on wires, though. Trust me, don't. Be, no. <laughs> there will be no people on wires. It won't be, you know, the Sandman musical can happen without me. <laughs> I don't know if a weird thing about Ron Greeny. So that's probably the next, the next one of those things on my, on my bucket list of things that I need to write before I get hit by that car. You're going to do a musical. That's awesome. Oh my god, okay, wow. That's, I'm excited. Okay, hang on. I got a tweet that I'm... I'm saying in a room full of people going, he can write a music. Uh, oh, what's the story that you're writing for Sam Weller's tribute book for Ray Bradbury, and it's from Tim Sherborne? Um, I don't know. I, I said I want to do a rape. He's doing a tribute book to Bradbury, which I think is a wonderful idea, and um, in which writers are allowed to do anything um, within any of the worlds that, that Bradbury's created. I do know the story of Bradbury's that affected me most deeply was probably, well, apart from Homecoming, which um, I loved, but I, I don't think I'd want to do something that will was a story called Usher 2, which used to be in um, the Martian Chronicles. It was in the English version of the Martian Chronicles called The Silver Locusts, about people walking through a, 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 an Edgar Allan Poe-like thing on, on the future on Mars. And I loved that, so, because apart from anything else, that was where I discovered my love of Poe was completely through, I'd never heard of him. I was, I was nine of reading this book, and here's Ray Bradbury enthusing about Poe, and everybody in the story is getting killed by Poe-like methods, you know, orangutans are turning up and shutting them up chimneys and things. And, um, you know, for the love of God, Montressa. And, and I, so uh, maybe, maybe something with that. Something on the, the Poe-Bradbury intersection. Uh, Shelley Roth wants to know. <laughs> Come on, a telephone. Um, do you remember the very first thing you wrote? Do I remember the very first thing I wrote? I remember the first. I remember being like three years old and and dictating a poem 
to my mum and saying, I've had written a poem and making her write it down. Um, it was about the dew. And it's not the mountain song. No, no, no. The, the literary dew, the stuff in the morning, because I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, that was the first thing that I, I remember, you know, dictating. I don't remember what the first thing I actually wrote myself was, but I do remember, um, I remember just, just lying on my bed, age seven, eight, and kind of writing poems and songs and... Issue 11 of the Sandman, all yeah. that stuff, yeah. <laughs> no. Issue six, Issue you know, six. the Dino one. Yeah. Um, uh, Henry, just Henry, wants to know, when you were in school, who was your favorite teacher and why? Who was my favorite teacher and why? Um, I think my favorite teacher ever also gave me the single worst piece of advice I ever got. Let me guess, you can't have your pudding till you've eaten your meat? Was that <laughs> that's, that's my picture all English school, I'm sorry. That's... <laughs> That was pretty much what they all said. It was, um, he, was, he was an American teacher, and he was called Mr. Wright, and it was W-R-I-G-H-T. It was my English teacher when I was about 13, and he was my favorite teacher of all because at the back of his classroom, he had a um, cabinet filled with books, that were his books that he just brought in and encouraged us to read, and nobody read them except me. But I read all of them, because there were things like Fritz Leiber in there, Fafford the Grey Mouser, that was the first time I ever encountered He had that in the back of the... In the back of the classroom. Oh, so I would, yeah. I would just hang around in the back of the classroom, just reading these wonderful works of obscure science fiction and fantasy, and just feeling happy and loving the fact that a teacher liked this stuff too, and I thought it was just the coolest thing. Um, in some ways, he gave me the single worst piece of advice I ever got, though, because I remember I was one of these kids who loved to excel. I, I liked I'm doing really well. It was fun. And um, he took me aside at the end of you know, my first year with him. Once again, getting English prizes and all this kind of thing and just loving it. And he said, uh, you know, Neil, uh, I was in Vietnam, <laughs> and uh, you know, I saw people taken down by friendly fire. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, I want to keep your head down. Things where because I just respected the hell out of him, I thought he was great. I, you know, he had science fiction books in the back. He was the only teacher I'd ever encountered who had even heard of authors that I liked. Um, I thought, right, okay, good. I can do that. I can be a C student. I can work at it. 